All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, before we get started, I just want to say we're here today for the uh, disposal of the case of State of South Carolina versus uh, Dillon Storm Roof. And uh, I believe the authorities have let you come into the courtroom with your phones. Uh, have no problem with the phones. I'm going to ask you to turn them off. Not on vibrate, but turn them off. I don't want to be distracted by the phone ringing. If the phone rings, the deputy's going to confiscate it. It will no longer be your phone. And I'll take whatever appropriate action against the individual that allows the phones to ring. So I suggest all of you take it off of Bob right, turn it off. And I believe I, the media is here. We got a, a television camera here, and we got the media taking live pictures. I have no problem with you recording the proceeding with your camera. However, any conference that may take place at the bench, you are not to record. And I think that was in the media order. Do you understand? Do we need to address any overflow for the crowd about downstairs? Pardon? We're fine. Okay. All right. Slust, I believe you here, do you want me to read the indictments or do you want to call the indictments? How do you want to I proceed? Call, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, we're here today and we have filed a plea agreement with the court. I believe you have a copy of that. Yes. And we have agreed to proceed with the trial. Okay. Your Honor, we're here today and we have filed a plea agreement with the court. I believe you have a copy of that. Yes. And we have agreed to proceed with the trial. Okay. That victim was Clemente Peking. 4117, murder. That victim was Daniel Simmons. 4118, murder. The victim was Cynthia Heard. 4119, murder. The victim was Susie Jackson. 4120, murder. The victim was Ethel Lance. 4121, the victim was Sharonda Singleton. 4122, the victim was Myra Thompson. 4123, the victim was Tawanza Sanders, and as I mentioned, all of those were for murder. There's also an indictment, 2015 GS 10-4124, for possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime, and 4186, attempted murder. The indictment lists um, Jane Doe, which is a minor child who was a grandchild of Felicia Sanders. Sanders, 48187, attempted murder. Um, that lists Jane Doe number two, and it has since been revealed publicly in other hearings and otherwise. That victim was Polly Shepard. And 4188, attempted murder, Jane Doe number three, and it has since been learned and revealed publicly that that uh, attempted murder victim was Felicia Sanders. We're here today, Your Honor, as we mentioned, for the defendant's guilty plea. Um, there are many victims present in the courtroom, as well as Chief Keel was led and Chief Mullen with the uh, Charleston Police Department. Okay, and I understand, Celeste, previously you served the death penalty notice. Is that correct? I have, Your Honor. And in return for the plea today, you were taking that off, withdrawing that. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Our, our agreement, our entire agreement is memorialized in the writing that we filed just before court. Um, the defendant has agreed to plead guilty, and he has agreed to waive his direct appeals. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pennington. Is that your understanding? Yes, sir, it is. All right. How does your client wish to plead? Guilty to all counts. Okay. Thank you so very much. All right. Uh, 
I believe we've had previous discussions, and this court is, has exclusive jurisdiction over the prosecution of Dylan Roof relating to the crimes as specified by the indictments and announced by the solicitor. Uh, I believe the state had had custody of Dylan Roof until last week, and when the agreement was entered into by all the parties, transferring custody to uh, the federal court and Judge Gergel issued an order on April the 3rd, 2017, transferring custody from the state to the feds with a temporary return of Bill and Roof today for disposition of this case. And I believe I got a copy of the writ. And I'm going to mark that as court's exhibit number one. I've got a copy of the agreement that the solicitor was talking, referring to about transfer of primary custody. And that's marked as court's exhibit number three. And I've got a copy of Judge Gerber's order. I'm going to mark that as court's exhibit two. And also the, okay, the petition, okay, the petition that was filed by the solicitor asking for the writs, courts four, and also the writ of habeas corpus on court five. Is that the understanding from the state as far as the jurisdictional custody issue? That is, Your Honor, but I need to point out that that is not part of the plea agreement. That is something that uh, the state wanted to work out so that we could clear the way for the federal death penalty to be imposed. I, I understand, but that, I believe that it, it, defense, it's um, part of the jurisdictional issue for this court to yes. dispose of the case. And you agree with what the court just said? Does the defendant also agree? We do, Your Honor. Okay. All right, Mr. Pennington, do you want to come to the podium or would you prefer standing there? Or I've discussed it with Ms. Armstrong and I think we would be better served uh, being right here. It produces less logistics. We have a three council. Uh, so if the court is comfortable, we would just speak here and that's all right. I understand you represent Mr. Roof. Roof excuse me, Mr. Roof, is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. I, and who else represents Mr. Roof for the record? Your Honor, for the record, Bill McGuire. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. P do you want me to address the question to you, Mr. Pennington, or all three of you? How do you wish me to proceed? Probably ask the questions of me, and if I need to confer with counsel, I'll ask the court's indulgence. Okay. All right, have you explained to the, your client the, the charges contained in the various indictments? Yes, sir, I have. Have you explained to us possible punishment? Yes, sir. Have you explained to us constitutional rights? I have thoroughly, Your Honor. In your opinion, does he understand the charges, the punishment, and the constitutional rights? I believe that he does. In your opinion, is he able to assist you with the defense? Keep in mind the ability to assist and willing to cooperate is not the same. I believe that uh, to the extent that there were any questions about competency that we're not raising any concerns or questions about his ability to proceed. Now, now I understand you want to you want to protect the issue that was raised in federal court previously, is that correct? Yes, sir. And that was raised pursuant to a letter that your client wrote to the attorneys and they had two conference hearings in federal court, is that correct? That's right. There were extensive hearings, there were, uh, there were pleadings, there were reports by experts on both sides of the question, and there were orders issued by Judge Gergel, which the court has and has referred to, and which I think bring us here today. Right, in your opinion, does the defendant have the mental capacity to assist you in preparing for this plea and or a trial if it was necessary? Your Honor, we see no issue. We're not raising any issue at all about that. Do you think he's confident entering into the plea today? We are not raising any. We have no questions that have not already been addressed, litigated thoroughly, and ruled on in federal court. Okay. All right, since your client was found to be confident by Judge Gergel on November the 25th and on January the 18th, has anything changed, including his demeanor, his appearance, his knowledge, his understanding, and abilities that would impact his competency? Since January, the last evaluation on January the 18th up till today. No, sir. Because I'm of the opinion, according to the cases in South Carolina, that's the area that I'm concerned with. I understand, Your Honor, and if, uh, our position is, is that there's really no issue, no new issue that's presented itself from the dates in January that you cited today's date. 
All right, Mr. Ruth, if you'll raise your right hand, please. The best you can. Thank you, sir. You swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, said to God. I do. All right, Mr. Ruth, during this process, I'm going to ask you some questions, okay? If you want to discuss any of the questions with your attorney, please let me know. I'll give you the opportunity to do that. Do you understand? If you don't understand the question, please tell me. I'll try to rephrase the question, or you may discuss it with your attorney if you so desire. Do you understand? Yes. I, uh, most of the questions are rel relatively simple, and I think you won't have any difficulty in understanding. First of all, what is your full name? Evans for Ruth. All right, what's your social security number? I'm not sure. All right, what's your date of birth? April 3rd, 1994. And how old are you now? Twenty-three. Okay. How far did you uh, go to school? Did you complete high school? No, sir. Did you get a, G a GED? Yes. When did you get your GED? Approximately. Late 2014, maybe. Okay. All right. How far did you complete in your formal school? Ninth grade. The ninth grade. You completed in the ninth grade. Okay. After you dropped out of school in ninth grade, what did you do? Did you stay at home? Did you work? Or what did you do? Um, I had one job for on and off. All right. What type of work did you do in that job? Landscaping. I'm sorry? Landscaping. Okay. What did you specifically do? Manual labor or what? Um, cut grass. Cut the grass. Okay. How long did you do that job? First time, probably about three months. Two months? Okay. Um, who did you work for? Do you remember? Yes, Clark's Festival. Okay. Have you held down any other type of jobs? No, sir. Have you, left, have you lived primarily at home or have you ever resided on your own? No, I've always lived at home. And with your mother? Have you ever been married? No. Do you have any children? No. I understand that you've been in the criminal court system, primarily the federal charges that you tried back in uh, January <coughs> across the street here in Charleston. Other than that federal court case, have you ever been in criminal court before? I was in the courtroom once, but I didn't, I wasn't charged. Okay. You were just sitting in the courtroom? Is that right? Right, it was for one of my other charges for my um, trespassing. Okay, all right. All right, Mr. Roof, within the last 24 hours, have you taken any medication, drugs, or alcohol? Judge Gergel found you competent in November again in January. Are you aware of any changes since then or any physical, emotional, or nervous problem that might keep you from understanding what you're doing today or what is taking place today? No. All right, the court is aware of Mr. Root's medical history pertaining to substance abuse and mental illness and have thoroughly reviewed those documents which be entered into the record under seal. And I believe that's marked this court's exhibit number seven. Number seven. Okay, would you hand it to me, please? All right, the court's going to mark the uh, Conference and materials in volume one that was delivered to the court by court order from Judge Gergel, which the court has reviewed and read and studied in great detail. And then volume one, which is marked as court exhibit number seven, that was a Dylan Roof letter to prosecution, a cover email to the letter to prosecution, transcript of November 7, 2016 hearing. Dr. Ballinger's November 15, 2016 conference report, Dr. Wagner's November 14, 2016, psychiatric report, Dr. Bowden's CV, Dr. Wagner's CV, transcript of November 23rd and 22, 2016, Compsy hearing, 
transcript of November uh, two th also day two of the conference here finds the facts and conclusion of the law December 25th on the defendant's comments and Judge Gergel find Mr. Baruch to be the And in volume two, which the court has reviewed, there was Dr. Balance of January the 1st, 2017 conference report, Dr. Lofton's psychiatric report, Dr. Mossberg's psychiatric report, Dr. Maddox's psychiatric report, Mr. Robinson's report, declaration of David Brooke, Emily Pavlone, Emily Stevens, transcript of January 2nd, 2017, conference hearing, memorandum of opinion, January 6th, 18, 2017, defendant's conference, of which uh, Judge Gergel found this to Mr. Roof could be confident. I, uh, is there anything else you would like to add as to the conference issue today since January to uh, that issue? Nothing on that. And primarily, I'm, I'm referring to the email that you sent to the court, I believe, last week on Tuesday, April the 4th, which I marked as the court's exhibit number six. <laughs> I'm asking to please address that. Your Honor, uh, just that we confer, uh, again, we're not raising any issue about Mr. Roof's competency uh, to enter this guilty plea. Uh, the questions that we have had raised in the federal court have been uh, litigated, raised, and ruled upon, uh, and therefore there's no new issues to present at this time. And since the last evaluation, do you agree that he has no, has been no change that would interfere with his ability to assist you in preparation for this guilty plea? There's been no significant change that I've been, I've been able to discern, Your Honor. And you understand the standard for the guilty plea is the same as the standard for trial? Yes, sir. Um, Ms. McGuire? Yes, sir. Do you also agree with that? I do. Ms. Norris, do you also agree with that? Yes, sir. Your Honor, may we inquire, I think I heard you say, but I just want to confirm, Mr. Ruth asked me, obviously these are matters that are under seal in federal court. And they will be under seal here. I think I'm, I thought I already said they're under seal. I just wanted to verify. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to place them under seal. They will not be open except by a circuit court judge or a appellate court judge on a direct appeal or a direct attack of this or any collateral attack as to this guilty plea such as a PCR. Very good. Thank okay. you, Your Honor. Now for the public and the news media benefit. I'm saying Judge Gerbel is going to release that material at some appropriate time after proper redaction of certain medical records. When that's appropriate, you'll have to ask Judge, Judge Gerbel. Now, I've questioned both the defense attorneys and defendant on the issue of competency not going to order further evaluation or a competency hearing for the following reasons. Mr. Ruth's appearance of capacity today while answering the question, Mr. Pennant has stated the court repeatedly would not raise confidence as an issue on behalf of his client. And we discussed the email earlier. Judge Gerbel found Mr. Pennant, excuse me, Mr. Ruth competent on January 24, 2017. I've already gone over the documents that have been marked as court's exhibit. I won't go over them again. I've thoroughly reviewed those documents and considered them. These documents will be marked as the court's exhibit, as I said earlier, under seal. And as I said earlier, Judge Gergel found him competent. And I would like to state and refer to the following cases whereby the courts of the opinion that since there was a mental capacity evaluation done, uh, one approximately two and a half months ago, and another one about five or six months ago. There's no need to have a composite evaluation at this time, just merely the issue of whether anything's changed since its last evaluation. The test is not whether the defendant is actually cooperating with his attorney, but rather if he has the mental capacity to do so, as State versus Reed, State versus Bell. And, uh, Where the defendant has been found confident, the mere fact that one time lapse between the determination and the trial does not automatically require a reevaluation pursuant to State versus Adams, State versus Drayton. And State versus Drayton says, failure of trial judge or the further examination here to determine the defendant's capacity to stand trial 
did not violate the statute authorizing the trial judge to order such examinations nor deprive the defendant of due process of law where a previous presiding judge had found about two and a half months before the defendant was fit to stand trial. There was no additional facts to warrant further examination or hearing. And while contending that the defendant was not competent to stand trial, his counsel refused to demand further comments or hearing the state in referring to prior determination. We believe that he has already been accomplished. Pursuant to State v. Bradley, when reviewing the statutory injunction in Section 44-23-410, this termination requires discretion when my discretion. I also rely on State v. Burgess with regard to discretion, State v. Motts on presumption of contingent competency. All the cases I have referred to will be in this court's exhibit. Based upon these considerations together, I find that Mr. Roof is still competent to enter this plea. He does so knowingly, intelligent, voluntary, with full understanding of the offenses against him. Mr. Bannon, how does your client wish to plea? I believe you previously said he wished to plead guilty. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. From your investigation, facts, and circumstances of the case, do you feel that the state could produce sufficient evidence to convince the jury of his guilt? Yes, sir, I do. And you feel that's in his best interest to enter the guilty plea? Yes, sir, I do. All right. Mr. Roof, you are pleading guilty to nine counts of murder and three counts of attempted murder. Is that correct? Yes. And a weapons charge. Pardon? And a weapons charge. I believe we have to deal with the weapons charge later. But Mr. Bannon has an objection to that. Is that correct? Only, it's not an objection so much as a comment about how the statute reads. I understand. The statute reads that basically you don't sentence them when you've got it covered. That's my reading of it, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Mr. Roof, do you understand that the possible maximum sentence for the murder under the negotiated plea would be life without parole? Do you understand? Yes. And you have nine murder charges. That would be nine life without parole. Do you understand? Yes. Do you have any question of that? No. On the three attempted murders, you could receive up to 30 years on each one. Do you understand? Yes. Do you have any question about that? No. Do you understand the possible maximum sentence you could receive on all of them? Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand that you will not be eligible for parole on the life sentences? Yes. It means what it says, life without parole. Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand fully the nature of the charges against you and the range of possible sentences? Yes. Do you understand when you enter a guilty plea, you give up certain constitutional rights? Do you understand? Yes. You give up the right to a jury trial. Do you understand? Yes. At a jury trial, the state would be required to prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you understand? Yes. You could offer witnesses on your behalf as to a defense. Do you understand? Yes. Your attorney could cross-examine witnesses, present evidence on your behalf, and the jury would unanimously have to find you guilty. Do you understand? Yes. You could offer testimony on your behalf, or the attorney could offer other witnesses on your behalf, or you may testify on your own behalf if you so chose. Do you understand? Yes. No one knows about a jury trial. Do you want a jury trial? No. Do you understand that you have the right to remain silent on the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution? Yes. No one can make you testify against yourself. Do you understand? Yes. When you enter a guilty plea, you will be acknowledging your guilt. Do you understand? Yes. When you acknowledge your guilt, you will be testifying against yourself. Do you understand? Yes. Are you willing to give up your Fifth Amendment rights today to enter your guilty plea? Yes. Do you 
you understand by entering your guilty plea, you're giving up all your constitutional rights. You understand? Yes. Do you understand you have a right to appeal the guilty plea 10 days from today? Do you understand? Do you have that legal right? Yes. Now, you have entered into an agreement whereby you are waiving your right to appeals. Do you understand? Yes. Uh, you got a I believe you entered into that April the 10th today. Is that correct? Is that correct, Mr. Root? Yes, that's correct. At least it's dated today. Is that correct? Yes. You signed it. Is this your signature on the document I'm looking at? Yes, it is. Do you understand that no one can force you to waive your right to appeal? Yes. Is anybody forced you, threatened, intimidated, to make you sign this waiver? No, they don't. Do you understand when you sign this waiver, you will not be able to make a direct appeal to this case? Yes. When I say a direct appeal, I mean appeal it to the Court of Appeals of the South Carolina Supreme Court. Do you understand? Yes. And this appeal does not affect any type of collateral attack on this guilty plea, such as a PCR or some other uh, legal collateral attack. Do you understand? Yes. Which is PCR is on the civil side of the court, not on the criminal side. It's not. A, you understand? Yes. Have any questions about this plea agreement? Excuse me. This waiver for the appeal. Did you fully understand the conversation you had with your attorney about the waiver of the appeal? Yes, I did. Mr. Pennington, have you fully explained the, the appeal waiver to your client? Yes, I have. Do you think it's in his best interest to enter that uh, agreement? I certainly do. And do you, have any, do you have any difficulty communicating with him about the agreement? On this subject, not at all. Do you feel like he fully understood that agreement? I believe that he does. Mr. McGuire, have you discussed it with your client? Yes, sir. And he, you know, you are of the opinion that he fully understands the agreement? Yes, sir. Ms. Norris? Yes, sir, I agree. Thank you so very much. All right, I'm going to mark the plea agreement as the court's exhibit. Another constitutional right you have, uh, Mr. Roof is a presumption of innocence. You're presumed innocent until you walk into the courtroom and the state has proven you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and all 12 jurors have found you guilty. Do you understand? Yes. In waiving your jury trial, you're giving up that right of a presumption of innocence. Do you understand? Yes. Have any questions about that concept? No. Now, I think we've discussed this before, but you do understand that the sentence of life without parole means what it says. You will never be eligible for parole. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Has anybody coerced you no. out of your guilty plea? No, Has anybody coerced you to enter into the uh, plea negotiation agreement and or the uh, waiver of your appeal? No. Has anybody intimidated you? Have you had enough time to make your decision and your guilty plea? Yes. Have you had enough time to, to consider whether or not you want to sign the appeal waiver? Yes. Have any promises been made to you other than the <coughs> plea negotiation of life without parole and removal of the death penalty? No. All right. Now, there's also and the agreement about federal custody in the, what's the court exhibit, what number is it? In the memorandum of agreement on the transfer of primary jurisdiction, in that agreement it says that you will serve your time in 
federal custody, you understand? Yes. And you signed it, is that correct? Yes, sir. I believe your attorney, Mr. Pennington, signed it, who represents you here in the state court, and your attorney, David Brooks, signed it, who represents you in the federal court, is that correct? Yes, sir. And it's also been signed by Beth Gray, United States Attorney District of South Carolina, by um, Mr. Wheeler, Acting Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division, and by the Solicitor Scarlett Wilson, do you understand? Yes. Now, I understand it in everybody's opinion that you will serve your time in federal prison. What I want you to understand is no one in this courtroom can guarantee that or promise that, do you understand? Yes, this court doesn't have that authority to order the Federal Bureau of Prisons to accept you, nor does your attorney, nor does the solicitor. Do you understand? Yes, sir. That's strictly up to the Federal Bureau of Prisons to accept you. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Now, according to everybody's opinion, that's going to happen. Do you understand? Yes, sir. But I have no way of controlling that's what I want you to understand. Yes, sir. Does that interfere with your ability to enter this guilty plea today? Thank you very much. Are you entering this guilty plea of your own free will in the court? Yes. Have you understood all my questions? Yes. Have you asked them truthfully and correctly? Yes. Do you have any question when asked the court or your attorney about anything that I have asked you up until this time? Yes. All right. All right, the following questions, Mr. Roof, apply only to your state attorneys, okay? Mr. Pennington, Mr. McGuire, Mr. Norris, not to any attorneys who represented you in the federal case, you understand? Yes. Are you satisfied with your attorneys that have advised you and represented you in this case? Yes. Have you talked with your attorneys often and for as long as you feel necessary for them to properly represent you? Yes, I have. Do you need more time to talk to your attorneys? Have you understood your talks with your attorneys? Yes. Have your lawyers done everything for you feel that they should have done? Yes. Is there anything that they have done that you feel that they should not have done? No. Are you completely satisfied with your lawyer's services? Yes. Do you have any complaint you want to make about your lawyers in any matter whatsoever? You understand on the pistol charge you can receive up to five years, you understand? However, under the interpretation of statute in the South Carolina case, the court will not sentence you because the life sentence will cover that time period, you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Constitutional rights that I previously explained to you? Yes, sir. How do you wish to plead? Guilty. And are you guilty of the nine murder charges, the uh, three attempted murder charges, and the pistol charge? Yes, sir. All right, what I'm going to do at this time, Mr. Roof, I want you to listen. I'm going to ask the solicitor to give me the facts in the cases, okay? And after she gives me the facts, I'm going to ask you if you agree with those facts. If you disagree, I want to know specifically what you disagree with. Can you do that? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, as you might, might imagine, uh, there has been a lengthy investigation and there are mounds of evidence against this defendant. 
I'm going to give you a brief summary of the facts uh, that we would have presented had we gone to trial. Uh, and most of them I understand you're familiar with, but we need to make our record for the court. Uh, as you know, this occurred on Wednesday, June 17th of 2015. The victims that were listed in the indictment, um, DePayne Doctor, Clemente Pinckney, Daniel Simmons, Cynthia Hurd, Susie Jackson, Ethel Lance, Sharonda Singleton, Myra Thompson, Tawanza Sanders, and also Felicia Sanders, Tawanza's mom, and her grandchild, and Miss Polly Shepard, all were um, of Emanuel Church, and they had um, gathered for a meeting and Bible study at Emanuel Church here in Charleston County. Uh, these 12 students and teachers of the Bible weren't alarmed when the de defendant arrived and entered and, and wanted to join their Bible study. And in fact, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, they welcomed him. Uh, he sat down with them, he joined them, and they listened and they studied the gospel alongside him. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Reverend Senator Pinckney's wife and daughter were in an adjoining um, study, uh, pastor's office, uh, just outside of where the Bible study was taking place. Um, after close to 45 minutes of study and of fellowship and around the time of the closing prayer, the defendant uh, took his 45 caliber pistol and opened fire. Uh, Reverend Pinkney was the first to be murdered. Reverend Simmons was next and the others um, after that. Uh, as the women sought cover and held together, the defendant walked the floor and systematically uh, fired at each of them striking the nine victims multiple times. Uh, as he walked around uh, in the fellowship hall, uh, shooting these innocent people, Tawanza Sanders tried to reason with him, telling him that they meant him no harm and that they didn't uh, mean to cause him any difficulty. Um, he made a number of racist statements uh, in the fellowship hall and continued to shoot and kill um, Tawanza Sanders along with the others. Miraculously, somehow, Felicia Sanders and her grandchild and Polly Shepard uh, were not struck by gunfire. <coughs> Immediately, Your Honor, a manhunt was led by Chief Mullen of the Charleston Police Department and Chief Keel with SLED. Uh, their departments worked together and the FBI became involved immediately as well. And this was truly a joint investigation by those agencies, uh, SLED, uh, CPD, the FBI, and then on into North Carolina with agencies there. Uh, the defendant was apprehended the next day in North Carolina. He gave a knowing and voluntary confession to FBI agents who did a remarkable job of interviewing him. Uh, in addition, CPD, with the help of Ms. Althea Latham, uh, who worked at the Mother Emanuel Church, they recovered a video that showed the defendant entering and leaving the church that night. Uh, the investigation continued and uh, it revealed that the defendant had planned this attack for months and that his planning including research of Mother Emanuel AME, scouting trips to Charleston, and that his plan was to kill specifically innocent African Americans and uh, his hope was to start a race war. Uh, as I mentioned, Your Honor, there are mountains of evidence against the defendant, uh, written confessions, a verbal confession, and these would have been the facts that we presented had we gone to trial. Okay, thanks, Mr. Mr. Ruth, do you agree with those facts? May I have the court's indulgence? Yes, sir. Mr. Roof, do you agree with those facts? Yes. All right. Uh, I find that Mr. Roof's afraid the volunteer and only intelligent made the decision to plead guilty to his license attorney. I'll allow him to charge has been met. There's two areas that I may have flipped my mind and not gone over. I want to go over very briefly. 
Uh, Ms. Pennant, has Mr. Roof had access to all the discovery materials and evidence against him in this case? Yes, he has. Mr. Roof, do you agree with that? Yes. And uh, the plea negotiations, there have been plea negotiations, I think I referred to them when we first started. Uh, have there been any other negotiations list? Uh, no. withdrawing the death penalty and entering the plea to death gave a life. No, Your Honor, and in fact, there is a paragraph in the plea agreement that explicitly states that is the entire agreement. Have we marked the plea agreement? I have filed it with the clerk, and I've sent you a copy, so it should be public. It's marked. Okay, I think I marked this course. All right, look, Ms. Pennant, any other plea negotiations that you haven't just told the court or the court's aware of? No, sir, the court's covered everything that we've discussed. Okay, thank you so very much. I, uh, Solicitor. Yes, sir. I'd be glad to hear you from any victims that would like to speak. I'd be glad to hear anything that they would like to tell me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. thought I had said that all elements of all the charges have been met, and if I, if I didn't make that clear, I hope it's clear now. Yes, sir, it is. And, and I did not enumerate the elements of murder and uh, the pistol and the attempted murder, but uh, all those elements have been met based upon what the solicitor had told the court and what Mr. Ruth confirmed occurred. And, and we did go over those elements before the hearing today so that Mr. Ruth is familiar with the formal elements of these, each of those offenses under South Carolina law. Okay, all right. So I'd be glad to hear from any of the victims or the families, anyone you would like for me to hear. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Um, as you know, there has been a lengthy federal trial across the street, and um, the victims' families and the surviving victims were present throughout. They have been um, present and supportive of our prosecution as well. They understand, Your Honor, that this is a negotiated plea, that this sentence is carved in stone, for lack of a better expression, and that um, since you've accepted the plea, uh, that there is no leeway in the sentence. Um, however, some of the victim's families still wanted to address this court, and uh, they are here to do so. Um, and we will first start, Your Honor, although not technically a victim in the classic sense, um, Pastor Eric Manning, who is the current pastor of Mother Emanuel, wanted to address the court. And we would ask that he come forward. Yes, sir, I'd be glad to hear you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, if it may be okay to turn my cell phone on to read the statement. So I'm, I'm sorry? My cell phone just turned it on. Is it all right? Yeah, that's fine. All right, wonderful. I also, as well, have a statement from uh, Bishop Samuel Lawrence Green Sr., the presiding prelate of the 7th Episcopal District. Um, Your Honor, you have heard the, the families and from the families and the, one, the impact of the horrific activity that took place on June 17, 2015. And
And even now, as we stand before this court, with the sheer number of members from Mother Emanuel. Mother Emanuel has been a place where several of the victims' families have, and survivors have come together to pray together, to worship together. The church within the African American community is, and has been, and continues to be a cornerstone within the community. And for almost 200 years, Mother Emanuel has done that. It has been a place where several of the family members have deep roots, where they have come together on numerous occasions to worship and to praise God. The impact to Mother Emanuel has been far-reaching. Uh, we visit the crime scene every day. Uh, we worship in the place where nine lives were taken and five survivors' lives were changed forever where hatred and evil try to take out and snub out the light of Christ. The impact to the families, to the survivors, and to the church has been felt throughout the entire congregation. Many worshipers are still having challenges coming to worship at Mother Emmanuel. Several times we've had to sit with the family members with congregation members to comfort them, to console them, to encourage them, to demonstrate the love that God commands us and the faith and the strength that was shown through the survivors and through the family members. The resilience that they have continued to display from June 17th on to this day has continued to inspire so many. And we would indulge and encourage this court to just remember that the church as well as the families and the survivors have paid a dear and deep price. But nevertheless, the resiliency which has been shown will continue to inspire not only the church members, not only the survivors, not only the families, but we would pray the entire state, country, and world. For surely love is always stronger than hate, and hate will never win. We, uh, as Mother Emanuel, will stand together, trusting and believing and knowing that the God that we serve has brought us through this valley and through this season, and will continue to do such. The remarks from Bishop Green says the main actions of Dylan Roof on June 17, 2015 has caused irreparable damage to the families of the victims and the survivors and their families of Mother Emanuel AME Church and also the 7th Episcopal District and the Connectional Church family. His intentional racist actions has impacted who we are as a church family and how we do church going forward. He took a promising pastor, upcoming clergy, retired minister, devoted, dedicated, and committed church members to the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Whereas his actions were and are horrific, horrific and was intended to make and push his racist plan of hate, division, ugliness of humanity. The families, the survivors, responses of love, perseverance, unity, and strength became the platform that spoke louder than the voice of bigotry of Dylan Roof. Bishop Green praises God that these families and survivors who had to relive the, hor the horrible June night over the video and the, f and the photos from the federal trial have continued to show their resilience and 
their perseverance. To this court and to the world listening, the real story is that these families and all who were affected directly or indirectly in this, Mr. Roof, your senseless actions did not work. Racism did not prevail. Hatred not, did not reign. Not when this world process, possesses people like these families in this courtroom and the Mother Emanuel AME Church family across the length and breadth of this world living out our lives, always remembering and reminding that love is always stronger than hate. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, man, thank you so very much. Uh, Senator Malloy is here on behalf of um, Reverend Senator Clemente Pinkney's family, and I believe would like to address the court. Yes, sir. May it please the court, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Your Honor, I'm Gerald Malloy. I'm a practicing lawyer. I've um, been practicing more than 25 years, and I serve in the Senate where I serve with Senator Pinkney. Um, I've been in a courtroom like this many times, and I find this um, very challenging. Um, Mrs. Pinckney is not here today along with her children, but she wanted me to speak on behalf of the family and to let the court know um, who Clemente Pinckney was. Um, first of all, she would have us know that he um, loved people. He loved to serve people. He loved helping people. It didn't matter where or who you were or where you came from, he extended a helping hand and an open heart to people from all walks of life. Had Clemente Pinckney been living, he'd be number 12 in the Senate in South Carolina of 46. Um, by all accounts, he started preaching when he was about 11 years of age and um, had his trial sermon at about age 13. He pastored a church at age 18, had been a presiding elder, and had been the pastor at Mother Emanuel for the last five years prior to his young death at age 41. Um, she had a statement that she wanted us to, to say, is that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We humbly ask that you all continue to be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. We should remember our important roles in this life, as Clem would say, and in preparation for the next, but also never forget that we all are part of a grander and more perfect plan in which we give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Our worldly justice is delivered here today and in the federal court verdict and sentencing. We thank those, all of those that have labored to understand, present, and ensure justice is served and preserved for all time and for all reasons it is needed. It is our hope that everyone finds peace. T today, Mr. Um, Representative Mr. Pinkney is also Mr. John Pinkney, Mr. Pinkney's um, father, and Ms. Mervyn. Um, Reverend Pinkney leaves a family, a wife, two children, a br a bro two brothers, a sister. He leaves his church family and his Senate family and a state and nation that mourns for his loss and cries for his leadership. It is our hope that we pray God's blessings on the defendant's family and all the families impacted by this tragedy, and particularly all the victims' families. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, next is um, Mr. Graham, who is Cynthia Graham Hurt's brother. Is it Melvin or Malcolm? Melvin. Is it Melvin, okay. My name is Melvin Errol Graham, Jr. I'm Cynthia Graham Hurt's brother. I just want to take this moment to say that <clears throat> since the beginning of my sister's death, our family has tried to be her voice. We've tried to speak for her, uphold her, and fight for her. And I would say on behalf of my family that we're glad that this saga is over. My family has allowed me to speak for them, and I just wanted to say just a few words because I want to let my sister speak for herself at the conclusion. 
My sister was at the Bible study, studying the sower seeds. And they say Christ taught things in a simple way that people could understand. The sower dropped seeds on stone, and the birds devoured it and took it away. That's to defend it. The seeds fell on ground and had little worth. But when the sun came, it withered away because it had not much root, faith. I've seen that happen. Some of the seeds fell to Mount Thorns and were choked. Right now, Your Honor, myself and my family feel like we're in the midst of thorns and weeds. This situation has tested our faith in every way possible, but I'm glad to say that we're still holding on. Some of the seeds fell on good earth and sprang forth fruit, 30, 40 fold. I call those the Emmanuel now. Since this tragedy, they have beard fruit. Even though they're not with us, they gave their lives and they are bearing fruit to this community, to this city, and to this nation. Because after the Emmanuel now, maybe I wasn't listening before, but I'm listening now. I hear families of other tragedies say those words that become so famous now. I forgive you. Never heard it before. Maybe they were being said before and I didn't hear it. But I hear it now. I forgive you. And I'm hoping and praying that this feeling of love and forgiveness will continue throughout this city and this state. I'm not going to stand before you long. I'm going to let Cynthia speak for herself because she left behind her own words. It's dated March 19, 2013. It's an email she sent to my sister, Avril Jackie Jones. My sister was having a rough time dealing with the passing of our parents. My father died in 83, my mom died in 86. This text was written in 2013, still trying to deal with the loss. And then Cynthia emailed her back saying, Oh, my sister, it's just the sting that goes away. Not the memories. That's why Easter is so special and my favorite holiday. It reminds me that death is not forever and we will have a chance to be reunited again one day. But I miss her too. You are not alone. Talk to you later. So, thank you. Thanks so very much, Mr. Grant. I'm Blondell Copley Gadsden, sister of Myra Thompson. I come before you today to thank the court for everything that has been done on behalf of the families of the Emanuel Nine, to thank the South Carolina court for working along with the federal court system so that we could reach this milestone in getting closer to finalizing this trial, or the trial for Dylan Ruth. Um, my family and the other families have gone through a tremendous, tremendous amount of hurt and despair, but we can see a little ray of sunshine the closer we get to finalizing this trial. I also want to say thank you to the team of attorneys who have worked to get us to this point. But most importantly, I want to say again to Dylan Roof that 
even though we, we're at a point where death has been the sentence for him, my heart still goes out to him in hopes that he would repent to save himself from himself. I, I can't think of anything worse that he could do at this point than to not accept Christ and try to make his days on this earth a little bit more peaceful. So I come here today not to, to do anything more than to thank the court system and on behalf of my family say that we are pleased with everything that has been done and thank you. Thank you very much. Eva Jackson Dillard, the sister of Susie Jackson. I come here thanking, looking after Ruth, take the love of our life, got others mixed up, and he has life without parole. When he gets life without parole, the state is still going to take care of him. I think with somebody doing something like that, he should get death. He has so many people. Every time we see him on, on TV, it upsets you. So if he could go into church and kill nine people, how he is here going to be here with life without parole. I really think if you have to do it again, I think she should have death. If nine people is dead, plus their family are miserable from missing them, then we don't need to look after his face on TV every time they want to talk about him. I'm very sorry, I'm a child of God, but he hurt the entire family. Thank you, ma'am. Your Honor, I believe that that um, includes, um, there is one other victim who would like to address the court if she could come forward. My name is Hamidi Lance Coyer. I'm sorry, what was your last name? Coyer. Okay, yes ma'am. I'm the daughter of Ethel Lance Washington. Yes ma'am. Um, today I wanted to address the court. I wanted to say to Dylan, I'm the one that forgave you in the bond hearing. And I still do today. And also that you came here to start a battle, but I went to war. I wore white today to let everybody know the chapter in my life right now today is closed. I will not open that book again. And I just want to say, have mercy on your soul. I'm done. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else? I believe that's all we have. As you have seen, um, since June the 15th of 2017, um, a remarkable showing of faith and forgiveness. 
uh, by these families. And I think what we've all learned is that forgiveness doesn't always mean that there aren't consequences for actions. Uh, these families have been very supportive of us when we were seeking the death penalty of the federal prosecutors who were also here in their death penalty trial. And uh, they decided to let the court system do its job and to let us as prosecutors do our jobs. Uh, we have explained to the families uh, in writing and in meetings and uh, over at the, the federal trial that we believe that this is the surest way to see that Dylan Roof is executed. Uh, they understand that. They have supported us. And I, I could not be more grateful uh, to these families for their support. It has been an honor to serve them. Uh, and we hope that today truly will close a chapter for these victims. They've been through a lot. Um, but hopefully now the court system can wind on without them having to be present, without him, them having to endure another trial, and so that we can see that the defendant is executed in due time. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Pettiton, be glad to hear anything you would like to tell me, Mr. Roof, anybody you would like to speak on his behalf. I don't believe that Mr. Ruth has anything to say, Your Honor. Um, I did attend the federal trial, um, and uh, I've had occasion to speak with his mother, who is not present here today, uh, because of health reasons she fell ill uh, attempting to attend proceedings across the street. Uh, she has expressed to me her love of her son and her heartbreak over the events that have occurred here and the heartbreak over the loss of the families. Uh, I think that feeling is echoed by his grandparents who were present in the courtroom uh, and uh, those Does, does grandparents want to address the court? I'd be glad to hear them if they have anything to so. say. I'll ask them again, Your Honor, but my sense is, I, I discussed this previously, and my sense is, is that they did not, they felt, I think, that words cannot express, that the, the words are sort of unable to express their depth of feeling. There is certainly an awareness of this tremendous loss to this community. And they were certainly aware of the feeling. Yes, sir. speak. I apologize for my raspy voice, but I had some unfortunate surgery some years back that left me kind of worse off. But in any event, um, I want everyone to understand that nothing is all bad, and, and Dylan is not all bad. I taught a Sunday school class some years back, uh, and I never will forget the response to it, because Everyone said, and I entitled my little presentation, The Devil is Real. And everyone who was there in the class of about 40 or 50 people, mostly in the 80s at that time, where I am today, uh, they, um, they appreciate the fact that good pe people do bad things. Bad people do good things. Uh, they, they had lived long lives, and we, are, we have been distressed and just sick over what has happened to these families who have been represented here today. Uh, Lucy, my wife, and I have them in our prayers every night, every meal. Uh, it's all we can do. It, uh, it's the only thing we could do, and we have tried very hard to be aware and sensitive to their problems. And, and, and there's no way we can ever feel what they've felt and what they've lost, just as no one can understand what we've been through. Uh, 
Okay, it's, it's been a, well, it's been a situation where I've never thought it could happen, anything like this. Uh, never. I'll get back to Dylan for just a minute. Dylan and I are grandfather, grandson. We had fun in those roles. We did things together. We talked. We stayed. Uh, what happened here, I, I will never understand. I will go to my grave not understanding what happened. Uh, only I know that I've lost a grandson that I love very much. And likely today is the last time I will ever see him. And um, I haven't touched him since this horrible event. Uh, and and I, I'm just aching to, to hold him and hug him as I did when he was a tot. Uh, but we've tried to be supportive of his counsel and the prosecutors and uh, I have to say that uh, the, the system which I worked in almost 60 years now and believe in uh, seems to have worked as it should have worked uh, to my unprofessional in this area uh, experiences. Uh, that I'd, I'd like to say more but I I just want to say loudly and repeatedly and constantly, we're sorry. We're just as sorry as we can be that this has happened. We regret it. It's ruined lives, and and I, I cannot put those back together. Uh, so I'm sorry it happened, and I'm, I'm not the kind of boy who makes long speeches. I'm a real estate boy. <laughs> Mr. Ruth, you, you probably don't remember this, but when I was in law school quite a few years ago, I was a law clerk for Kit Eastman and Gene Bracken and King Holmes, who was in the real estate, and I, I think King finally left the firm and went to work for Lawyer's Title. And uh, I, I'm sure you won't remember it, but King Holmes was involved in some real estate transaction with you and drug me over to your office one day, and I met you many years ago. And, uh, I think you'll find gentlemen a good lawyer. I'm awful sorry for the hurt and embarrassment that you have gone through, and primarily for the loss of your grandson. But thank you so very much for being here. Thank you, John. Okay. All right, anything else from uh, no, sir. Mr. Ruth? No, sir. I don't believe so. Okay. All right. Uh, I would also like to say to the victims, I'm awful sorry for your loss. It's a tremendous loss. It's a tremendous loss to the community. And uh, there's just no way to explain it. I don't think anybody can explain it, why it happened. Or, but it did happen. And uh, Mr. Roof is going to be sentenced accordingly here in state court as well as in federal court. And I do hope that this, that today, will put an end to the, or at least, put some closures where you can start suffering or get over the suffering and you're grieving and move on uh, if you can move on. I don't think you ever get over something like this. You just sort of don't think about it and move on in life. But I'm awful sorry for the victim's loss. It's a real tragedy. It's a tragedy to the community. And I wish I could sit here and say, hey, I know why it happened, but I don't. I don't think anybody knows why. Uh, uh, I know the news media, every time they have a crime, first they want to know is why. Well, if it was the same process, the same act, they may have a why, but it's not a sane act. It's a crazy act. It's a foolish act. It's crazy. But I do want to say I'm extremely sorry for the victims, and uh, I do hope that this will bring some closure to you and your families in the future. Thank you so very much. So let's see anything else. Yes, sir.
from when I was addressing the victims earlier and talking about uh, building a roof is a uh, crazy insane act. I'm talking about the layperson insane. I'm not referring to any insanity uh, defense, uh, legal defense, which is different from the layperson's uh, opinion. I think it's just a crazy, unexplainable act. And that's what the court was referring to. But I do uh, sympathize with your loss. Indictment number 04115, Sun State Department of Correction, period of life as consecutive. Indictment number 04116, Sun State Department of Correction, period of life as consecutive. Indictment number 0411, Senate State Department, period of life, that's consecutive. Indictment number 04118, Senate State Department, pressure period of life, that's consecutive. Indictment number 04119, Senate State Department, pressure period of life, that's consecutive. Indictment number 0411. Excuse me, 4120, Senate State Department uh, for life, that's consecutive. Indictment number 04121, that's Senate State Department pressure for life, that's consecutive. Indictment number 04122, Senate State Department pressure for life, that's consecutive. Indictment number 04123, Sun State Department of Correction for life that's consecutive. Indictment number 0186, that's the attempted murder. Sun State Department of Correction for 30, 30 years, that's consecutive. Indictment number 04187, that's attempted murder. Sun State Department of Correction for 30 years, that's consecutive. Indictment number 04188, that's Senate State Department press period of 30 years, that's consecutive. And then the uh, attempted gun charge of Senate State Department, zero time. Anything else from the state or defendant? No, Your Honor. Court is adjourned for. Thank you very much.